So I finally watched another crap video and there was a lot about it that I liked. There's a reason why Trump's Biggest Mistake, a video that's mostly about China, has over 4 million views. It's a brilliant piece of work. Even in a video from three years ago, it's clear that Kraut is a master of this medium. Parts of it are presented with comic strip humor and irreverence, and then it switches seamlessly into Adam Curtis-style archival footage with jarring music cues. The video whiplashes across all of Chinese and world history with what looks like stunning erudition. Somehow Kraut makes it all work together and has crafted a supremely engaging style for delivering a message. Unfortunately, the message that Kraut is delivering is kind of crap. It's nowhere near as bad as the Chomsky video that I reviewed last time. This one is more filled with mistakes than lies. But Kraut's China video is almost more disappointing than his Chomsky one because it's just filled with such MSNBC or Fox News bog standard style propagandizing. On the strength of this admittedly three-year-old video, I think it's fair to accuse Kraut of just being another cog in the US military industrial complex. At this point, I should probably clarify what I mean by military industrial complex, because my definition is a little different from the one that others use. Here's an old clip. The military-industrial complex is metastasizing. It's not the thing Eisenhower warned us about 50 years ago. It's much, much bigger. The crucial element is time. For 50 years, this system has been growing. Defense contractors now include a surprising number of businesses you would never think of, but the U.S. military buys a lot more than just guns. Military money funds an immense ecosystem of journalism, universities, and think tanks, all of which are knowingly or unknowingly dedicated to the continuation of the current system. In Eisenhower's day, there were people in government, media, and academia who remembered an era before militarization. Those people are now all dead. Very few working within this system can even see how absurd it is. The U.S. military industrial complex isn't just a set of institutions, it's an all-encompassing ideology, and it's international. It's a way of looking at the world that you have to consciously try to see beyond. I'm not saying Kraut is being paid by Washington, D.C., or that he's even doing this consciously. but. On the basis of this three-year-old video, I think it's fair to accuse him of being a servant of U.S. empire. We hear a lot about how nobody respects authority anymore in the internet age, and how governments have lost control of all of the narratives. I believe that too, until January of 2018. Most politics nerds were understandably focused on the Donald Trump show, which allowed Washington, D.C. to roll out a seismic shift in U.S. foreign policy. After wasting $6 trillion on the obscene failure of the war on terror, the Pentagon published a national defense strategy refocusing on great power competition. After 20 years of creating terrorism everywhere in the name of security, the Pentagon confidently asserted that it would now be using our tax dollars to create, or, uh, or rather to fight, great power competition. Initially, I thought this new national defense strategy would be ridiculed into non-existence. Let the gang that destroyed the Middle East loose on economically important countries like Russia and China? <laughs> During the Trump administration? There's no way that our famously adversarial media ecosystem would let Trump get away with something like that. It simply wasn't possible. Well, it turns out it was very possible. In fact, that's exactly what happened. To my surprise, almost every media source in the United States and in Europe got on board immediately, regardless of supposed partisan affiliation. It was almost as if they'd been given marching orders. Even the business press that had spent 20 years selling China's economy started a very successful campaign of fear-mongering about the security of Taiwan's semiconductor industry. The idea that China had somehow fooled us or betrayed us by not turning into Switzerland within six months of joining the World Trade Organization became the new party line, from the Trump administration to the New York Times to The Economist. And by October 2019, the China panic had even made it to a German YouTube channel. 
Because here is an uncomfortable truth that we are only just starting to realize. China's economic growth blinded us. It prevented us from seeing how its society developed and what it developed into and how. Kraut's China panic, just like the Pentagon's, is rooted in some pretty fundamental misunderstandings of how the world works. I have two main critiques of Kraut's China video, and they are both about history that he either misunderstands completely or consciously leaves out. In this video, Kraut, A, doesn't understand the past 2,000 years, and B, ignores all the relevant geopolitics of the past 20 years. In my first video on Kraut, I explained why I hadn't watched many of his videos. And this China video is the one I was complaining about specifically. I've always had a lot of trouble watching his videos. They're just so goddamn long. And whenever I try to watch one of his videos, I usually stop when I get to some glaring error or blatant misinterpretation. If something's an hour long and I come to something that's just clearly wrong on minute 10, I usually can't bring myself to watch the rest of the video. Here are some of the errors that made it so hard for me to watch this video initially. For almost 2,000 years, the world revolved around China, and all those empires, kingdoms, and republics that banned trade amongst themselves all traded with China. The Chinese market and Chinese products are what dominated European, Middle Eastern, and even African economies for almost 2,000 years. This is a central facet of the China panic narrative. China used to run everything, and now they're coming back. You see this idea everywhere, despite the fact that it's complete bullshit. This idea of a historical Chinese hegemon is the worst sort of presentism. It's an indisputable fact that for long stretches of the past 2,000 years, China was the most sophisticated and economically developed country in the world. But what that meant a thousand years ago, or even 50 years ago, was a completely different thing from what it means today. Amusingly, Kraut acknowledges how much the world is constantly changing within this video, but somehow misses the broader implications. The previous year, the American businessman, Malcolm McLean, frustrated with the immense difficulties of loading and unloading goods on ships, trucks and trains, came up with the idea of a standard measure metal box, specific for trade, unified international dimensions and easy to transport. The Americans would not adopt the metric system, but they certainly knew how to use it. This invention, and the 26th of April 1956, are dates that will go down in human history of similar significance as the invention of the printing press. It completely revolutionized global trade. Suddenly, everything could be transported quickly, efficiently, at low cost across the entire world. This is a great point. The world got exponentially more connected in the 1950s. But what Kraut neglects to mention is that this was only the latest exponential growth shift in trade over the past 500 years. The standardization and grading of agricultural commodities in the 1800s was another massive shift. So were railroads and steamships. Trade got exponentially bigger at multiple different points in the process of building our modern world. But you have to understand the flip side of this too. This means that the rewards of being the biggest economic player in the world get exponentially smaller as you work your way back through history. Before the Industrial Revolution, we did not live in a world that is anywhere near as unified as it is today. Sure. China was a strong empire for a while that you had to approach humbly to trade with. But that's been true for dozens of historic empires, from the Aztecs to the Byzantines. China's sheer historic size and continuity does make it special, but it didn't give them magic industrial trade powers in the ancient world. The direct European silver for Chinese porcelain and silk trade didn't last for 2,000 years, as Kraut implies. It barely lasted for 250 years, between the advent of the Spanish and Dutch in Asia and the British crushing of Chinese independence in the 1840s. Before the British knit together the first world system in the 1750s, the world was vastly more isolated than it is today. Yes, there were growing trade links, but the world had much more separate histories. Empires could rise and fall in different parts of the world without directly impacting everybody else. China was probably humanity's biggest economy for long stretches of time, but that didn't actually mean much. China never dominated the world. Which brings me to the point where I stopped watching this video two years ago. The first British trading missions to China offered the Chinese their newest and most modern technological advances, and the Chinese rejected their offer in Latin. 
because that was the language of those Europeans they had the trade deals with. The fact that the Romans had stopped existing over a thousand years ago didn't matter to them in their cultural mindset. This is complete hogwash. It's the level of historical understanding you'd find in a Jackie Chan movie. There were no governmental contacts between ancient Rome and China, let alone trade deals. It's possible that an ancient Marco Polo or two made it from one capital to the other, but they left no record if they did. If Kraut's anecdote has any truth to it, the Chinese spoke Latin to the British in the 1700s because Latin is what the Jesuit missionaries to China of the 1600s, like Matteo Ricci, were speaking. Some of the misunderstanding here may come from the concept of the Silk Road. It was almost never a highway or railroad that a single set of merchants would ride from one end to the other. It was a series of chunks. Some Chinese goods made it to Rome, but they passed through multiple hands to get there. At least until the Mongol invasion of the 13th century, there were empires full of prosperous middlemen in between East and West. There were no trade deals between China and Rome. It may seem like I'm spending too much time on ancient history, but the myth of ancient Chinese dominance is key to the US military industrial complex narrative that Kraut is pushing. But most crucially to Xi and Xi's main mission and agenda is to rebuild the geopolitical power that this past empire once had. Xi's main mission and agenda is to rebuild the geopolitical power that this past empire once had. There's no question that China wants to be rich and respected and would be happier if the US had less of a presence on the Chinese border. But the baseline assumption that China wants to run the world due to past glory is deeply dubious. Kraut and the rest of Washington DC's warmongers assume that China wants to run everything, but it's based on faulty historical assumptions, like the one I just laid out here. Kraut's video is also based on a deeply flawed approach to contemporary history as well. There are some parts that it isn't really fair for me to critique him for. This is a three-year-old video, and it's not Kraut's fault that many of the assertions he makes now look ridiculous. The panicked passages on China's sinister move to loan money and build infrastructure in Africa look pretty silly now, but that's because we're speaking from the future. The five minutes Kraut devotes to China's purchasing of Australia also look pretty silly in light of the way that relationship has deteriorated. Even the US mainstream press is beginning to concede that the Belt and Road Initiative is somewhere between harmless and a massive failure for China. Now I could have told you that five years ago, but this standard China panic drivel was the Pentagon mandated majority opinion in Western media back then, so I can't really blame Kraut for believing in it. I could spend 10 minutes telling you why you shouldn't be worried about Chinese investment abroad, but why bother when the YouTuber Polymatter has already done such an amazing job? You can check out their great summing up at a link here or in this video's description. Kraut is absolutely right to call Trump's China strategy a failure. Trump's choice to not just attack China, but also attack all of the US allies we needed to effectively isolate China at the same time was a world historically stupid thing to do. I've said elsewhere that Donald Trump was China's biggest opportunity since Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941 and gave the Chinese an all-powerful ally against Japanese imperialism. After Trump's election, a savvy China could have stepped up and stepped in and become the world's champion of civility and globalization. In 2017, I shared Kraut's horror at Xi Jinping's trip to Davos. The 15th of January 2017, a day that will go down in the history books, is when China had one of its greatest triumphs. At the World Economic Forum, an event hosted by the elites of global capitalism, the president of the Chinese Communist State was the opening speaker, lecturing the world on how to do proper and more free trade, and how his nation would take a leading position in such. America's president wasn't even present. At the end of this video, Kraut even goes so far as to say, China has taken full advantage of his presidency, more so than anyone else, to aggressively push further than any previous Chinese government and set its global ambitions into stone, while everyone else was distracted with a funny looking blonde man, because apparently his presidency is all about triggering the libs and no actual coherent policy. Trump was China's greatest opportunity since Pearl Harbor. 
And five years later, we can say with great confidence that China completely fucked up that opportunity. They could have risen above Trumpism and won the world, but instead they decided to jump down to his level, get in the gutter with the pig, and alienate everybody with wolf warrior diplomacy. Trump said some nasty stuff to our allies, but China actively arrested their citizens and sanctioned their legislators. China committed crimes against humanity in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and even managed to fall into lethal border disputes with India. Three years ago, Kraut's video could still make a good case that China was on the path to victory. After COVID, with a faltering economy and a workforce that is both declining and getting more expensive, the Chinese Communist Party is beginning to look like the gang that couldn't shoot straight. Today's Chinese government doesn't look like the rulers of tomorrow. They look like a bunch of idiots. But you can't blame the Kraut of three years ago for not seeing that. I think there's a much deeper flaw in Kraut's China video, though, that goes far beyond some of its fear-mongering aging poorly. Kraut has made a video about geopolitics, with a strong focus on the first two decades of this century. It's compelling stuff, and he pulls out all the stops, audio-visually speaking. But it's deeply wrong, not because he's lying about what China is doing, but because he's pretending that China is the only power doing anything. In Kraut world, China is already well on its way towards being the world's only power, and it seems to be making choices in a vacuum. The same way the Americans found themselves confronted with the problem that some free market countries are not free, China found itself confronted with the problem of free market countries that are free. And those free countries might limit their trade based on how your unfree government may behave. They are accountable to the public for democracy and law. The public in such countries might not approve of business with dictatorships or backdoor dealings with them. So, what do you do with these pesky democracies? I'm sorry, pesky democracies? Is that really the story of the past 20 years? China reshaping the world while a few embattled democracies desperately try to stave off Chinese imperialism? Is it China that's been driving worldwide militarization over the past 20 years? What did these Venezuelan riot police, Kenyan troops in Somalia, Ecuadorian police, and Sudanese soldiers all have in common? They all use Chinese equipment, Chinese armed vehicles specifically built for riot control, Chinese personnel carriers, Chinese mass surveillance systems, and Chinese rifles. Kraut is absolutely right that China sometimes does bad things. But his approach is kind of like telling the story of the US conquest of Asia and nuking of a couple cities during World War II without mentioning the attack on Pearl Harbor or the horrors of the Japanese Empire. China absolutely has been acting out over the past 20 years. But it's not because they're trying to build a world empire. It's because they are, quite rightly, terrified of the United States. The century's first U.S. government, under George W. Bush, inaugurated a policy of open-ended war. Anywhere on the planet, it felt like going. In the process, it destroyed and occupied a number of sovereign countries, including Afghanistan on the Chinese border. The Obama government claimed it would be more friendly to the world, and then destroyed Libya, the richest country in North Africa, inaugurating waves of jihadism and a lost economic decade for some of the poorest countries on Earth. In destroying Libya, the United States also managed to completely screw over China and Russia at the United Nations, promising that we would not use the humanitarian mission the Security Council improved for regime change, and then doing regime change. It's key to point out that in his second term, good cop Obama openly announced that he was going to pivot the notoriously helpful American war machine to Asia, and convince Japan, China's greatest historical tormentor, to abandon its decades-old policy of pacifism. Obama was followed by Trump, who claimed to be laser-focused on attacking China in almost every campaign speech he gave. The current U.S. government has kept Trump's tariffs on China's lifeblood, international trade, and even though it's busy slaughtering Russian troops in great numbers in a Ukrainian proxy war, it has decided that now is the perfect time to kick off a new Taiwan crisis. China's choice to respond to all of this with crimes against humanity in Hong Kong and Xinjiang to secure its border and intimidation to secure its sea lanes is deeply lamentable. It's sad and it's stupid and it should be confronted diplomatically. But 
Wow, is China not the 21st century's main agent of chaos? Kraut's China video is very well made. Unfortunately, it's also dumb propaganda. And it's not even his propaganda. It's U.S. government propaganda. Three years ago, Kraut was doing the work of U.S. empire. Pure and simple. In the interest of closing on a more friendly note, it's important to mention that this is a three-year-old video I'm talking about. Scanning some of his more recent production, it looks like Kraut's gotten a little bit more skeptical of U.S. government policy. I recently watched his new video, The Folly of Liberal History, and enjoyed it immensely. I believe it's based on some Francis Fukuyama work I've also found useful. I disagree with parts of it, of course, but I think it's a really well done video that makes some really good points. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and comment, and click the bell next to the subscribe button if you want notifications when I upload new content. Thanks.